Hello, I'm Ayo Akimolari. I'm a broadcaster, change maker, and world record swimmer. And welcome to this episode of Gowling WLG's Language of Leadership podcast. In this series, we're exploring the lessons business leaders can learn from sports, what winning behavior sports leaders show, and how we can use these in the world of business. Working with me will be my co host, Charlie Unwin, a sports performance psychologist. Gowling WLG has analyzed the language used by elite individuals in sport and in business and developed six lessons for business leaders to take from sports leaders. Today, we're going to look at showing confidence at all times. Before we introduce our main guest, Charlie, give us a glimpse as to what you think this means. Cheers, Io. So confidence, it's a massive, massive word as, as we're going to find out in this. But fundamentally, I think the reason this came up in the research is because sports leaders see confidence management as being really pivotal to success. It's all very well being able to kind of marvel on the talents of the people that we have around us and their capability. But if they're performing up there one day, down there the next, we don't get that consistency that's essential for, for high performance. Mm -hmm. And it's very often confidence that determines that consistency. Uh, and it is one of the greatest predictors, certainly in sports, of performance. So sports leaders are very tuned into the language of, of confidence um, and what it takes to build and maintain confidence levels. Okay, well, joining us in the studio to share his experiences in this area is Paul McVeigh, ex-Premier League footballer turned performance psychologist. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Ayo. Thanks very much for having me. And, and hello, Charlie. But firstly, we're record swimmer. Uh, yeah, we're just, Whoa, uh, are we going to brush over that? Ca casual. You just casual. drop that one <laughs> in. Just drop that bad boy in. Sorry, yeah, sorry. These things happen. You know, we'll talk about that a little later on. But yeah, <laughs> right, it was, Congratulations, uh, first th of all. Well, look, I, I think we're all fitted perfectly to talk about the idea of confidence really and I'd love to really explore this uh, uh, so much more. Well let, let's start with this then really. How we bring confidence into our everyday language as leaders and why we need to do this. Charlie do you want to kick us off on this one first? Yeah so uh, I think confidence because it's so important like there's a language around confidence mm -hmm. and, and we're interested in, in what that language is that, that comes up in sport all the time. When, when performance is analysed what is it? Uh, what is it that kind of lends itself to why you know someone did something that they they you know they could do or, or every day in training, but they couldn't do under that sort of point of pressure? Um, so that the language of confidence, I think we need to be able to be much more kind of tuned into. Whereas, you know, arguably in business, it doesn't get spoken about as much, which means that, of course, if you don't have a language for it, it's difficult to measure it, have any degree of self-awareness around it. So it's difficult to kind of help people, coach people around confidence. But I mean, Paul, you, you must find that, you know, because you've bridged both, you know, mm. sports and business, you must find the same. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. I, I I love the subject, and so appreciate you asking me to come in to talk about it and share my, my feelings and my thoughts and insights. But I think the starting point is really to try and understand what it is. You know, if you were to ask someone what is confidence, most people I think would give you such a wide variety of answers. Mm. Probably wouldn't really be able to define it. And I think even more importantly, where does it come from? So you're talking about language, and if you're just talking about the linguistics that we use, then yes, we can talk in certain ways that makes us confidence, but then there's also the behaviours that you display, whether it's in your chosen field, sport, industry, and are you behaving confidently or not? And again, that's more of an observation that maybe the leaders and the coaches that we would have worked with mm -hmm. may be able to tell from that. But I think the starting point's got to understand what is it and where does it come from? Mm. And can I, can I, I heard at a conference run by the Premier League, I heard this fascinating bit of research. I think it came from Norway. I don't know if you've heard the same about uh, penalty taking. And they found that penalty takers are more likely to be su more successful when they place the ball down and walk backwards. backwards. Don't turn their back to the goalkeeper. Don't turn their back to the goalkeeper. Their back, their back to the mm -hmm. goalkeeper. Now, now, I'm sure there are all sorts of kind of mechanisms that we could look at that, that sort of lead us to, towards confidence. It's a demonstration of confidence that you stand upright. But of course, it, it causes many people to ask the question, well, why don't you just teach people to walk backwards because then they're more likely to take, you know, get the penalty. 
But they've kind of missed a point there, haven't they, slightly, is that it's not just about the behavior, it's about the felt or the lived experience. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and that's such a great point. It's, it's, I don't know if you ever heard about how, you know, there's um, more break-ins whenever ice cream sales are on the up. And it's just because it's in the summertime, more yeah. ice cream sales go up, but it's also because people leave their windows open, so yeah. people break into houses. So are they linked? Does Whenever someone walks backwards, are they linked? Maybe statistically that what happens, mm. but actually mm. does that impact whether someone does it or not? Mm. I think this is a really interesting point you're talking about penalties because I have a, a little exercise I run through when I'm working in the corporate world and I try and help people understand where performance comes from. So confidence, interestingly, when I was working as a sports psychologist with those Premier League clubs that we were talking about a little bit earlier with you know, Norwich City mm. and Crystal Palace, out of all of the years that I worked with the best players in the world, you know, people who are at the very top of their game and want to get better, so back to that constant never ending improvement, the number one thing they came and spoke to me about was confidence. Mm. So for me, it's that correlation between confidence and performance and they're saying, okay, so can you help me with my confidence? And I'd say, absolutely not. <laughs> and, they're, and they're like, well, why are you here? Why, why are we paying We're you? paying you to give us confidence. <laughs> but in, in that vein then, you know, um, you know, leaders will have a, a team working for them. A, a, a football team, for instance, will have, will have a coach. You've got various versions of confidence there. Look at Cristiano Ronaldo, right? Abundance of confidence. You've got a young lad who's just graduated from the academy, got his first team um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Probably not the same kind of confidence. How do you manage that um, as a leader? Well, I think that comes back to what is the confidence? What are we trying to achieve here? Mm -hmm. And really, I think what Charlie said, it's not that up and down mm -hmm. level of performance. We need consistency. But just to go back to the point of what is the confidence? Can I give it to him? Can I help them? And ultimately, what psychology tells us, I'm not making this up, and Charlie hopefully will back this up, that all of our thoughts, all of our thinking, ways of thinking, our habitual thinking patterns drive how we feel. So if that's your emotional, let's say, um, consequence of how we think, well, then if you start to put this into even some like cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. just as simple as your thoughts drive your feelings, your feelings drive your behaviors. So when I'm asking players, so where does confidence fit into any of those three areas? Is it a thought? Is it a feeling? Or is it a behavior? Some people would even say there's a fourth option that it might be all of the above, mm. potentially. But whenever I ask someone, I would follow it up with, well, I think confidence is a feeling. If I'm walking out in the Premier League stadium, if I'm walking out in front of 75,000 people at Old Trafford or 50,000 people at Anfield, I will either walk out feeling confident or unconfident. Mm. Now, very simple deduction. So how does, how does my feeling come to bear? It comes because of how I'm thinking. So really, when they come in to see me, they're saying, well, can you help me with my confidence? Can you give me confidence? Like you joked about earlier, mm. oh. well, no, I can't because it's their thoughts that are going to determine how they feel, which is going to determine how they behave and ultimately their performance on the field. So I can't give it to them. But what I can do is help them understand that it's everything that they're thinking about themselves. You know, that little, mm. let's call it little devil, devil on the shoulder, shoulder. Yeah, your imposter you syndrome, about, yeah. you know, that little voice or, you know, some people have voices in their mm. head. So, but it's, it's making sure that that, intrinsic language or psycholinguistics as we call it what is that saying on a repeated basis because effectively we're speaking to ourselves all day long mm. while, we're in, while we're awake and, and almost inevitably that voice comes back almost to one question really isn't it which is can I do it can I do it and, and then the operative word being it what is it um, and so how important is it that you're able to help people give clarity on what it is in order to then start or sort of kickstart that cycle of now I'm thinking correctly, positively, that's affecting the way I think, which affects the way I perform. Well, mm. again, it comes back to their expectations. It's like a player, an athlete, um, someone going in to do their job every single day in an office. What is your expectation for that day? Are you going in looking for perfection? Because if that's what confidence is for you, well, probably not going to happen. Mm. Highly unlikely. I've never played a perfect game. You mentioned Cristiano Ronaldo, he's never played he's a never perfect, played game. perfect game. So the difference is, what is your expectation? And then it's almost like on a sliding scale mm. of, do you feel more confident, do you feel less confident? And I think the trick is, how do you help people who are less confident more of the time to start moving more along the spectrum, to be more confident more of the time? And again, language, behaviours, if it's a skill, mm. practice in the skill, if it's mm. a close skill. But then of course, there'll be lots of times when we can't control all these things. And then it's a case of, doing it 
you probably will mess up if you haven't done it many times before and then mm-hmm. keep repeating repeating but always looking to improve which goes back to the other episode when you're talking about the constant never ending improvement yeah but that, I mean that that's something I'm interested in especially from a leader's perspective you've got various people with different levels of confidence how do you create an environment where everyone feels worthy everyone feels like they can put their best foot forward and come forward as confident as Cristiano Ronaldo who has played a million games and has operated at the highest stage and he relishes that well I'll tell you I'll tell you about Cristiano Ronaldo just as a simple mm. through the football and grapevine mm. that a story Rio Ferdinand actually tells and I think it's actually in Alex Ferguson's book that Cristiano Ronaldo the one year I had in the Premier League with Norwich City and managed to play against Ronaldo when he was a kid mm. in his first spell in his first year at Manchester United and I was playing right-hand side of midfield. He came on left-hand side. Now, on that day, he was pretty average, didn't really do well, looked like he was confident, but his performance was terrible. Now, at the same time, he's going in to speak to the coaching staff of Manchester United and saying, I want to be the best player in the world. So he's not the best player in the world. He's not performing at that level. Mm. But in here, in his mind, his Mm. confidence levels was, how do I do that? So Mm. to answer your question now, I'm not sure if you can create the environment so everyone's always confident, Mm. but you can see what other people are doing that allows that behaviour to Mm. be replicated. And I had the same thing when I first met Craig Bellamy when I'm at the Norwich City. Now, if you see a Craig Bellamy on the field, you know, really impudent, really aggressive, really tenacious, but actually when you see him off the feet, it's because his drive and determination to be the best of the Mm -hmm. best. So again, that's something coming from him. And all I did was, I didn't have that when I first met Craig Bellamy, but I mimicked him, I copied him, I tried to replicate what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I never got to his level, but I probably got more out of my ability Mm -hmm. purely because I was around someone who was super confident like Craig Bellamy. Yeah, it's interesting Mm -hmm. Mm because we're looking at leaders and it's something we touched on in the previous podcast is how much does the individual have to do for their worth their confidence what were your thoughts we, on that we, i mean it's great because we've spoken about the sort of um knowing our skill being confident in our skills mm. our ability what we focus on obviously dictates then how we feel but paul's nicely kind of highlighted in someone like ronaldo the importance of self-confidence mm. right it, it's an underlying sense of self-esteem which means I will back myself in any situation. I'll back myself, and that's a fundamental belief of or part of confidence. A lot of people don't have, you know, that ability to back yourself in that situation, even if it's just doing simple things really well. Um, and I, I, I've suffered from this myself as an athlete. So I remember of modern pentathlon fencing is one of the five disciplines, and it was the one I took up last. So the narrative I had inside my head was always. I'm, I'm the most junior at this in the British team. Um, therefore, I'm not going to win many bouts. That was true. But after three months, I still wasn't beating fellow members of the British team. In training, I was getting quicker. For, uh, um, I was getting more precise. My repertoire of moves was growing. But I still wasn't getting the results. And I suddenly realized, talking to my own psychologist at the time, I'm still telling the same story that I told myself as a junior athlete, which is, I'm new to this, I'm not as experienced. And I'd never updated that narrative. I'd never updated that story, which meant at no point was I kind of wiring up or showing up and telling a different story to get a different outcome and helping people with that narrative is such a kind of fundamental part of confidence, isn't yeah. it? I, well, I think it's a great point that you're talking about. And we touched on it earlier to say it's really, it's what's going on in your head. That little voice in your head and you probably didn't challenge your current narrative. And all of this, whether it's confidence, whether it's whatever we decide we are capable of, and this ultimately just, if we keep going deeper and deeper in this, this ultimately just highlights what our beliefs are. Mm -hmm. So it's our beliefs about ourselves of what we're capable of or not. I'll give a quick example. So when I stopped playing professional football, so I know I look, I know I look 14. (laughs) I was like, when was that? I'm actually actually 44, right? So I stopped, I stopped uh, 12 years ago. And when I came out of professional football, I'd never spoken in public. So Mm -hmm. even though we're around the table now with microphones, since then I've worked 10 years in the media, but I'd never spoken in public. I'd never done anything like this. Because I was so acutely aware that I was terrified of speaking in public, that I wasn't very good at it, that actually just made me so nervous and sweaty and all the rest of it. 
but I also knew the power. It's really hard to say in a mm. Belfast accent. Yeah. For you to understand. <laughs> the power, the, the, the power <laughs> of affirmations, and yeah. essentially that's just a statement that I want to say repeatedly to myself because mm. I'm trying to create a new neural pathway mm. of what I believe, mm. essentially what I believe about myself. And so I came up with this affirmation of, I enjoy every possibility of speaking in front of an audience. Mm. Now, in 2010, I was delivering my first keynote for Aviva, and suddenly I'm standing up in front of 150 people. And in my head, beforehand, I'm saying, I enjoy every possibility of speaking in front of an audience. The little voice in the back of my mind was going, no, you don't. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and then I did that. Then I go through the next one. And another week later, mm. and I'm saying this constantly to myself. Now, we go through the timeline, come to 2012, I've probably done enough times where it's starting to be less afraid mm. until eventually I got more enjoyment out of it. And let's just say 2022, it is the single greatest buzz I have in my professional career mm. is standing up and speaking in front of an audience. Now... Is that because I'm rewiring my brain or I just know the understand of how helpful and beneficial mm. affirmations are? But ultimately, it's the belief that I have about myself. Yeah, it's so interesting mm. you talk about that because one of the things I was talking to Charlie about earlier on this morning is that as a broadcaster, finding my voice is really important. How you start off, I've been trying to mimic other broadcasters that I like, blah, blah, blah. But you don't sound like yourself. But also, I did acting classes because I used to get really nervous on stage, right? And you wouldn't think it now, but I, because this takes a lot of work to get to this point. But what I also fundamentally realized through acting is that it allows you to think of it as a story, right? And I was focusing on the little tiny bits that were going to trip me up, and that took over my mental space. But also, my, my, my acting coach at the time said something to me, which really switched my perception. It's what you're talking about, changing the way your brain thinks. He goes, no one knows what your speech is. And whoever goes to a theater waiting for the actor to fail, why have you paid all that money mm -hmm. to go, mm, they didn't say to be or not to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I, no, right, I, want, I want a refund. No one does that no. because they're there to see you shine. Mm -hmm. So the audience has not come to see you fail. Yeah. So why don't you just enjoy being you? Yeah. And if you do make a mistake, they don't know. So, and, and again, this comes back to the psychological principle I would have come across mm -hmm. around focus theory mm -hmm. of when you are going into a task or a presentation or an interview or job, whatever you're going to do, it's going in and you have different ways of that you can focus essentially. Mm -hmm. Now one, probably not a lot of people do this, but it's essentially focusing on everything going wrong. What's the point in doing this? I'm probably going to mess it up. Not a lot of people are like that, but there is mm. a small percentage. I would say culturally, in this part of the world, most people go in trying not to mess it up. Mm. They go in thinking, I hope I don't go wrong. I hope I don't make this mistake. Mm. I hope I didn't. I forget that last bit when I was practicing. But actually, the best performers, the, you know, the best footballers in the world that I've had the fortune and privilege to mm. play with, people like, you know, Jürgen Klinsmann, mm. Teddy Sheringham, David Genela, Saul Campbell, all these, you know, outstanding players, their mindset and their focus, which helps them with their confidence, is all about whatever they're going to do, they're mm. going to do it to the best of their ability and they're going to knock it out of the park. Mm. Mm. They don't go in thinking, I hope I don't mess this up because mm. that's not what top performers feel like and they don't think like that and also people around them, they won't let them get away with that. Mm. Really, really interesting. You, I mean, you can't focus on not making mistakes, right? So I mean, saying don't think of a yellow car. Yeah. Don't think yeah. of a yellow car. <laughs> You're gonna commit, right? I mean, yeah. and how do you not think of a yellow car? Well, think of a blue car, and then the more detail you think of that blue car, you know, alloy wheels, tinted windows, what type of blue? The more you, the yellow car just becomes less relevant, I suppose, is the best way of putting it. And um, so, yeah, being able to deal with that is difficult, isn't it? We are negatively biased, something like five times negatively biased. Absolutely. So, again, that's a human instinct. That's probably part of our DNA. You could have a whole conversation on that separately. But what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get this front part of your brain to be less, as Charlie said, negative bias in pretty much everything we do and more have the this is what I want to achieve because our rational part of our brain can then help us move forward and do what we want to do. Yeah. Charlie, I'm interested. Are, are there different areas of confidence? And if anyone's listening to this podcast, are there ways of harnessing that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I, I think summarizing what we've already mm. spoken about so far, um, we've got c confidence in our skills and ability. And and, you know, sometimes you can get two people who, who look just as able as one another, but they could suffer very different or one could suffer confidence crisis. Another could be a very, very confident person and, and they will they will show up differently. So I it's like imagine walking on the edge of a pavement. Right. We could all do that. We've been walking all our life. But if the edge of that pavement wasn't three inches, but three miles, 
how would you walk? You know, it would completely change the way that you're doing one of the most fundamental skills in life. Of course, that drop is psychological for a lot of people. So a lot of people focus on what's to lose. So I think there's confidence in skills and being able to, as, as Paul says, to focus on what you, you are trying to do, not on necessarily what you're not trying to do. But then we've already spoken about the sort of idea of identity as well and who you are. Confidence in yourself as a person. What's mm. the story you tell yourself about yourself? Do leaders really check in with that? Or is it something they try and shy away from? Because... It, of course, it, it, it's not a way you don't know what you, what's going to come up if you start going down that route. And that's perfect reason for a lot of people just to push it to mm -hmm. one side and focus on our product, focus on our service, focus on our process. Mm. What I would say is, you know, confidence is and does relate to the lived experience of what we're trying to achieve. And so businesses are brilliant at coming up with strategies, aren't they? And they're brilliant at coming up with plans some better than others at coming up with plans but then we don't always have that conversation that goes one step beyond is what's this going to feel like to do mm. this what's it going to be like what's the point that's going to put most pressure on us what's the point where we might lose a bit of confidence what do we need from each other to to encourage us to keep the energy maintain the momentum it's that lived experience that doesn't get spoken about as much in business as it probably does in sport, where it's mm. part of the narrative along with tactics. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think to follow up on that, I think it's it's the you talked about earlier about creating an environment, mm. and I think it's creating an environment for people to feel, and that's where I think the difference is between the the sort of the corporate world and more of the sporting world that mm. I, that have had a foot in each camp for the last kind of twenty five years, and it's in sport you are allowed to feel. Obviously, they want you to do every pass, every shot, every tackle. They want you to do it correctly and perfectly. But actually, it doesn't happen all the time. So they probably give you a lot more leeway knowing that you can go and practice that. Mm -hmm. And in the corporate world, if someone doesn't hit their target, you know, if someone isn't kind of, let's say, pulling their weight or performing at whatever level they've decided performance looks like, it only has to happen a couple of times before mm -hmm. they're suddenly out the door. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not creating that environment for learning, for growing. And I suppose the final point on that is just really the confidence for me is so specific. A quick example. I very fortunately had, you know, nearly 20 years playing professional football and managed to play from a country and win a couple of titles and all these other things playing in the Premier League. I was, along with nine or ten other players, so people like Paul Scholes, mm. Michael Owen, Andy Cole, Marcel Desai, who won the World Cup yeah. of France, Michel Salgado, who was, you know, Spain, part mm. of the, the Galacticos in Real Madrid. We all went off to China a number of years ago to play in a futsal tournament. Wow. Now, futsal is very similar to football. Yeah, Brazilian. We got like. pumped. <laughs> <laughs> different skills. Every set, single though, game. Do you know set. why? Because it's not like football mm. at all. Because mm. we were trying to play it the way we play football. Mm. But even though it looks like football, it's played on a Close ball board. control, but smaller a, ball, heavier a, ball. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's everything that we would do that we've honed these skills over 20 years to get to the best in the world. <laughs> and listen, just to play in the Premier League, just to walk into that door, I feel... My career was down here because yeah, I scored yeah. like two goals in the Premier League. Michael Owen scored and hundreds. Yeah, yeah. These guys were the best. Like Marcel Desai won a World Cup. You at the very top of what I would consider possibly the most competitive and ruthless industry in the people mm. in the world because people would literally give the right arm just to get to that level. And some of the best players <laughs> in the world went to China. We got literally battered. <laughs> I'm going, how does this happen? But interestingly, because of the psychology angle, mm. I'm going, well, why should we do it? Because we're mm. playing a completely different sport. Mm. Might as well play badminton. For sure. That probably sure. would give us a better chance. Bit of a reality check, really. And unfortunately, it was back to the fact that confidence is so task-specific mm. and we hadn't been practicing futsal for 20 years. C can I, can I, firstly, can I ask, what's it like to score a goal in the Premier League? <laughs> the first question. Is there an easy answer to that? Um, the one of the best feelings you can I ever imagine. have but also very surreal and cred unless you're you know I was fortunate I got about 40 goals in my career so I managed to score in the championship over you know multiple seasons but the score in the Premier League one was on my home debut for Spurs 
and it was a header from three yards out with an open goal. So it's like, score the header. Now, my next question is, not this is the best feeling ever. How do I celebrate? Because I've never celebrated in front of 40,000 before. <laughs> and then secondly, my goal was whenever we played against yeah. Ronaldo at Old Trafford. And then I scored, but unfortunately we're 2-1 two, two, down. So mm-hmm. you're like, you can't really go and celebrate sliding on your knees and I'm everything. Just, uh, anytime you score you against Manchester United, is a, yeah. it would be wonderful for, a, for an Arsenal fan. It'd yeah. be fantastic. I'm, I'm interested in, in this next point in terms of um, the humanity within confidence because I also think there's like... A, there's a fine line between cockiness and confidence, right? And mm. someone who I think, from the sport world in particular, wears that humanity and confidence and also delivers and can be cocky, but justifiably, someone like Usain Bolt. Mm. You see this guy turn up, relaxed. You see him playing to the camera. This Honestly, he might as well have a bit of a stretch and a, <laughs> and a yawn at the side of the field. And he loves the audience he loves the fans and then he goes out and sets a world record and then he goes out and delivers like you've never seen before and that confidence and I guess at the level of cockiness that he is the best on this field he looks left and right and he's thinking there's no one better than me here is there a fine line between confidence and cockiness? I would say there's there's probably two schools of thought in this. Mm. One is Usain Bolt wasn't always like that because mm. you've seen different footage of him over mm. the years and even if you see the documentary about of him. Of course. And, and, you know, funny enough, I know his age and he's actually mm. from Northern Ireland. Mm. And you have this conversation and say, what you see in front of a camera, Beijing and all these mm. world records and gold medals, that's a performance. Mm. It's like, let's say... Chris Eubank walking in yeah, you know, it's like Tyson Fury yeah. walking in yeah. it's all a performance so what does he need to do to heighten his performance and scare the life out of all his competitors mm-hmm. when he's walking onto the, mm-hmm. into the stadium so you'll have that so essentially the two schools are do you have the belief before you happen have that confidence before you do it mm-hmm. or because he was gradually getting better that his confidence was growing until eventually he won let's say a world title and then his confidence was there and almost it was there for the mm. rest of his career. Now, I don't know him well enough or I don't know him at all to be able to say which one it was. But for me, the only way to do that is to believe it before it actually happens. Mm. Well, that's interesting because there has been research for, for decades, I think, sports psychologists and they've been trying to work out what comes first, performance or confidence. In other words, do you have to be confident to perform well or do you have to perform well to feel confidence? And I've asked that question to elite special forces. I've asked that question to Olympic gold medalists, to, um, you know, CEOs of FTSE 100 companies. And very often, most of the 90% of the time, they say we need to perform well to feel confident. Now, the difference Mm, is how they measure what what their reference point for performing well is. Because I think every day gives us the opportunity to do little things well. So if we're tuned into um, that sort of either kind of progression of where we're going, doing little things well, we will we will anchor small amounts of confidence all the time rather than wait for the big occasion. Martina Navratilova said that the moment of victory is far too short for live for that and nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, and so confidence, I think, requires us to perform well, to anchor and build upon that. But the question there is how are you defining performance? Mm. Which is probably the hardest, the hardest question. Oh my God. No, <laughs> listen, where do we start with that well, one? Well, so get two, again, two examples. If you try and understand what performance looks like in the footballing world, a friend of mine used to be the European head of scouting for Man City. Now, he would go and look at people like David Silva before they came to Man City and literally produce a big 300-page dossier on this guy, everything he's ever Mm. done in his life, in every aspect of his life, all of his stats, all of everything else. But then, of course, they give it to the manager or head coach at the time and go, what do you think? And then he's going to have a subjective opinion of we should buy him or we shouldn't buy him. They don't go, he's made this many passes, he's had this many shots, et cetera, et cetera. It's Do so like difficult. Yeah. So even in football, we think there are you know, a plethora of statistics. It still comes back to an individual subjective opinion. Do we want to spend mm-hmm. 50 million per, on this person mm-hmm. or not? It's even harder in the corporate world For because sure. you're saying, well, what does performance look like? Because if you have, you can have different matrices for to be able to put them into certain sections. You can have different metrics, but ultimately it's going to come back to how are they behaving? 
are they essentially doing what we're asking them to do? Mm. Like, and that's so, so what impact are they having? Uh, mm. That's so subjective when it comes to performance in the corporate world. Like, unless you talk about how many sales or how many widgets you sold that <laughs> month or whatever it is. But if you're not doing that, everything else is then subjective, mm. which again is incredibly difficult. And I'm fortunate to work across different industries. So I see how financial services do it. I see how technology does it. I see how utilities, etc. Every single one of them struggles. Mm. Can, can overconfidence be an issue? Is there such a thing? Yes, why? Why? Is, 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 why? Is there such a thing as overconfidence? It's, uh, mm. Do you mean like as in being, being complacent? Yeah, exactly. But that's different. Is, yeah. is that's overconfidence an out, complacent? That's an outcome. Yeah. See, so because I'm looking at the positivities and potential negativities of being overly confident if the results don't match, right? Um, and I think it's something you touched on, and you're like, they'll be out the door. Is that the right? thing to do um, to put them out the door can we nurture that in it, yeah it also in, doesn't in help way. their potential as mm. well I, I see I think people confuse the notion of arrogance yeah thinking it's the same as overconfidence I think it's subtly but profoundly different I, you know, I'd love to know what your thoughts are mm. on this Paul but I'm not sure arrogance is on the same scale as confidence it's a different concept the reason I say that is because someone who's arrogant is likely to be projecting confidence in order to, to have some kind of effect. So they probably doesn't come from the inside out. They're projecting something because they know they should, they know they ought to, or they're trying to protect a reputation of some kind. Um, whereas true confidence is about knowing yourself and what you're trying to do in, in that situation and believing in yourself and your skills to be able to do that, which means that you can't really be too confident on that scale because it just means nothing can shake you. So I think it's just a case of maybe differentiating the kind of the, the notion of arrogance mm. with confidence. Yeah, it's nuanced, but I think it's perception. If you look at someone, you're probably going to put them into different categories. Are they confident? Are they overconfident? Or are they arrogant? And loads of people think Cristiano Ronaldo is in a certain one of those yeah, three categories. Sure. That's fine, but he's doing all right for himself. <laughs> Let him crack on with whatever <laughs> he's doing. Those goals, passes, assists, <laughs> yeah. trophies will probably we'll, say we'll it we'll makes a bit of differ, right? Yeah. Yeah. Although I think, Phil, whenever we played against him in that day in 2004, <laughs> we have had similar career paths. <laughs> he remembered you. I, I, he remembered I, I, you. I don't know why that's the funniest thing you've laughed at all day. <laughs> I did hear him talk about Paul McVeigh yeah. in an interview the other day. So. Did anyone ever inspire you? <laughs> oh, yeah, I played this game with sure, Paul sure I wanted him to clean my boots before you left. <laughs> anyway, so the whole point is I was very, very fortunate. So my, my kind of education football and education was at Tottenham Hotspur in 94 to 2000 mm. and so unbelievably blessed to play with and make my debut with and train alongside Teddy Sheringham okay. every day for a number of years. Now, I would look at that guy and let's just say he was already the golden boot winner in the Premier League, Euro 96. He obviously mm. became a national hero, him and Shearer. Then, of course, he scored the win or the goal in the European Cup final sure. for, for Manchester United. When I saw him and everything that he did, I was just like, this guy is so supremely confident. He's got so much inner belief that what he's going to do when he's going out to play football, he's going to achieve it because mm. the confidence was there. But people who don't know him think he's really arrogant. Mm. Now, again, it's because they don't realize that he would be the type of player we'd come in on a Monday morning, mm. sitting there with the youth team, 16-year-old lads, and I'm sitting there with my Welsh mate and my Scottish mate and other Irish guys. And he would come in and say, right, guys, how'd you get on the weekend? Just have an idea of what you just do. And I'm going, this guy's just like been a national hero with him and Shearer up front. And he's coming in asking me, a 16-year-old kid who has nothing to do with his life or career. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of person he was. But even when you're out on the field, he's helping you, educating you. So I think it really comes back to how do people perceive you? And actually, probably a better question is, does it matter? Mm. Who cares? Because mm. once you get into the public eye, people are going to have an opinion and does it really matter? That, that, that's really fascinating because that in itself is a confidence to be able to shake off any sort of negativity that comes towards you. And I, I find that in, in, in the world of business, I find that in the world of sport, um, those people that f are fundamentally still themselves, regardless of what the circumstances um, may be, how do you give someone that? Or can you give someone that? It's like that? a deep congruence, isn't it, mm. with knowing who you are. And what, what I do is congruent with, with who I am, how I see myself, and what we're trying to do as a business as well. Um, you know, I, I don't, there's nothing greater that a, a business leader could do with their teams than, than to build confidence from the inside out, to... to, to 
to help people believe in themselves first and foremost. And in a weird way, it sometimes gets knocked out of them because we're worried that if they get too confident, they'll think they should get promoted earlier than they should do. Mm. Whereas actually, we kind of want to be channeling that. If we have honest conversations, they're not going to go down that route really. Um, That only happens when you do a kind of performance review process once a year and you realise that your expectations are massively in a world apart. Mm. But if you have regular performance conversations, I think people... You can have more honest conversations that build people's sort of confidence from the inside out. Um, I, I think giving people value, the sort of metaphor of how do you introduce an academy player into a senior team? Because I've seen it done really badly where, so, you know, the, our star players got injured. Mm. Um, they're out for the weekend. Therefore, we're introducing this player um, and, you know, it's all about overcoming the shortcomings rather than celebrating, you know, the value of that individual. They're, they're in the academy for a reason. Mm. They've got this far for a reason. Let's promote that. So I think business leaders can be much more um, conscious about promoting people's value and making that part of, you know, OK, it's, it sounds like a bit of a pat on the back type thing, but if a team cannot promote each other, then who else is going to do it mm, for yeah. them? So I think if you can engender that, it builds confidence every day. And it means that the kind of results will go up and down. We know they do, but our confidence doesn't have to be um, sort of knocked by that. Yeah. I mean, you basically summarized my next bit, which was... Apologies. What, no, no, I love it. Because <laughs> Stop, you're, stop you're, looking at us no, notes. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, is that far ahead of me? But, but, because, yeah, that's your takeout, really. That's the, yeah, I, I, I feel so. like that's the one takeout from your perspective you'd probably like people to take away fr- from this podcast in terms of confidence, right? And yeah, building confidence. yeah. And, and, and Paul, you know, and just to clarify a point in that, Paul, Paul mentioned about uh, sort of the importance of positive thinking, I suppose, mm. for want of a better phrase. But again, I think the other thing business leaders can do is to frame things. What do we want to do? Not what what don't we want to do? Mm. To, yes, by all means, have the strategy, have the plan, but to have that conversation, what's the lived experience of this going to be like? How are we going to know we've been successful? And almost kind of get them to feel that experience of it as if they've been there, as if they've done it. Familiarize themselves, prime them with the positive components of that. Our brain thinks in positives, you know, not Mm. negatives. So we've got to engender that, I think, as a leader. Yeah, Paul, if we could sort of think about all the areas we've covered, right? We've covered a lot. I mean, and there's there's definitely a lot more we can cover. What's the one takeout you'd love people to to take from this conversation we've just had? Confidence is intrinsic. Going back to the example I used with the, the... top quality players, international players coming in and and trying to help them with their confidence. And simple analogy that I would use is, and touch on your previous question, Mm -hmm. why do you have this ability to not care what people think? Well, because if we did care what what people thought, I'd be crying in some room in a dark place it's for true. a long, long it's time true. because yeah. the amount of times I've played at Elland Road mm. and 45,000 Leeds fans, well, especially yeah. when I had my ponytail, <laughs> <laughs> didn't really go down that well. That's all I'm saying. Now you're showing your age. Rag now you're showing your age. And I wore my gloves. In <laughs> anyway, so the whole point was when you listen to other people to have that inner confidence, mm. but a simple analogy is if a player came in and saw me after a game on the Monday and said, Paul, how do you think I played? And let's just say, or let's say he went and saw the coach and go, coach, how do you think I played? And the coach was like, well, I thought you did this. They're brilliant, brilliant. First team on the team sheet next week. Brilliant. Carry on. And imagine like your phone or your mobile, whatever it is, is almost like a little remote control for your confidence. Well, after that meeting, I'm coming out there. I'm buzzing. My confidence is mm. through the roof. And then let's say I go and speak to partner, my brother, my dad. How do you think I played? Well, actually, you didn't do this. So you gave the ball away loads. You slept over here. You had this chance. And I'm going to... And again, it's the same thing. Confidence mm. probably will go down. And then, of course, some people go on social media. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Let's just say that's not the most conducive way for high performance. Yeah. And ultimately, what I sadly see and observe, people not just in sport, but business leaders, members of teams all over the corporate world, it's like they're given the remote control for their confidence to pretty much everyone they come across. And I'm saying, no, no, no. You need to find it inside. Keep it. Don't mm. find it. It's yours. Mm. Keep it. Stop giving it to everyone else because if you keep it, that's conducive for high performance. Oh, goodness me. What a way yes. to end. That was so good. Really good. Look, Charlie, thank you. Paul, 
thank you <laughs> so much for your time. Uh, another really insightful uh, podcast episode, and I uh, hope you enjoy this one and the next one to come because that one is also going to be brilliant. Thank you.